This is the area, one of the areas where police have descended in the hunt for a fugitive. His name is Jokar Tarnayev. He is believed to be one of the two suspects. He is one of the two suspects in Monday's Boston Marathon bombing. He's 19 years old. You see him here in the white cap. His brother in the black cap, Tamerlan, uh, was shot and killed overnight in a firefight with police. Um, so we now know, uh, at the very least, that there were two. There are two suspects. We don't know if there are more suspects, uh, but this is what law enforcement has identified thus far. One further thing about Ta Tamerlan Tsarnaev: he was a gifted athlete and a boxer, registered in the United States as an amateur boxer back in 2003, 2004, also 2008 to 2010. This is really important information because up until this morning, we didn't know how long these men had been in the United States. Now we've been able to establish by talking to Boxing USA that at the very least, Tamerlan Tsarnaev was in America 10 years ago. Richard Falkenrath, who's sitting right beside me, and I spoke with one of Tamerlan Tsarnaev's former sparring partners, uh, a man who, who told us uh, he'd prefer to go by John Kay, did not want to relief or reveal, I should say, his surname. And Richard, I, I think it's worth playing for everybody an excerpt of this conversation with John Kay talking about Tamerlan Tsarnaev, one of the suspects in Monday's Boston Marathon bombing. He was like an extremely gifted athlete. I mean, uh... I just remember seeing him do his warm-ups and his routines, and uh, you know he was really strong and really uh, athletically gifted. And uh, I mean, so that that might be the only thing I could think that would lead to him his military training. And I mean, his boxing was was uh, really really good. So Richard. We know now, as I say, that Tamerlan Tsarnaev, in and out of America, perhaps for at least a decade, that time period that we're speaking about, 2003, 2004, again 2008 to 2010, these are the periods when he was registered with Boxing USA. Anything we can say about those? Yeah, this was uh, the bloodiest phase of the uh, military op operations undertaken by the Bush administration in the aftermath of 9-11. So very interesting. He starts his amateur and you boxing. Were, I'll remind everybody, for a good part of that time period, you were in the White House advising George W. Bush. Yeah, that's right. I, uh, yes, I was a deputy homeland security advisor to President Bush. And uh, his, his amateur boxing period, I, I don't know that he traveled abroad, but there is a very significant gap between 2003 to 2004 and then beginning in 2008. That period. 2004 to 2008 was a very violent time uh, with immense casualties. I think we, we thankfully don't remember it that well anymore. But for many of the people who became radicalized, uh, that was a catalyst. That was often a catalyst, and uh, it was a period of really intense, bloody violence uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, in particular, involving U.S. forces with, with extensive collateral damage. So one of the things I know the authorities will be looking at is did he travel abroad in that time? And of course, we are surmising to a degree here that there may be a connection between Tamerlan and Jokart Sarnaev and radicalized Islamists. Yeah, I mean, they definitely became terrorists. I mean, he, right, doesn't, that, he wasn't born a terrorist. So at some point in his life, uh, he decided to become a terrorist and kill innocent people for whatever reason. And the authorities will, we will all want to get to the bottom of that. What was it that motivated him? Why did he do it? And importantly, was he assisted by anybody else or any terrorist network. And one of the other questions we're asking this morning, what were these people like? That's what John Kay helped us to understand. Let's play another excerpt of that conversation with John Kay, former sparring partner of Tamerlan. To be honest, uh, he was a bit, you know, kind of arrogant, cocky guy, you know, a little quiet, but I mean, nice guy, uh, you know, helped everyone out, talked with everyone, um, you know, kind of mind his own business. So really hard, I mean, we can tell a little bit about what Tamar Lanzar and I was like uh, by virtue of that conversation with his former sparring partner. Uh, quiet, cocky, at times willing to help, but also at times arrogant. And from my vantage point, the thing I'm most interested in is he was purposeful and disciplined. Right. I mean, to be, to You compete. have to be to get to the golden glove. Exactly. And those are attributes, if you were recruiting terrorists, those are the kinds of people you want. You don't want the flakes, the ones who don't have their act together, who can't get to work on time. This is someone who was disciplined and purposeful not an antisocial personality and as what we've seen on the receiving end of terrorism these are the sorts of people who are the most formidable enemies frankly Richard the fact that these two men were brothers does that say anything is that on I, I presume that's well, somewhat common. Uh, it, it is common. The 9-11 hijackers included certain brothers. The other one was very much younger. and Seven years and it from what we understand. It stands to reason that his older brother brought him along. So while his older brother was competing as a Golden Gloves uh, athlete, his younger brother was 9 or 10 uh, and you know clearly wouldn't have had any idea of what was going on. This is a very interesting dynamic which, which will be unraveled here. And uh, I guess I'm wondering to myself, what might 
we talked about this a few moments ago, but where exactly are law enforcement or, uh, or agencies going now in the hunt for more information about, I mean, we've been able to find uh, his boxing records, for example, Tamerlan's boxing records. That's public information. We have to hope law enforcement authorities have that as well. But what else are they getting? So um, they are getting a lot. I mean, they are contact tracing of the, both of these individuals. It's one of the main methods that they use, and they are doing electronic surveillance and communications tracing to the best of their ability. Uh, and that, from that, they, uh, they are also doing interviews of people who've known them or live nearby with them or work near them to understand their pattern of life uh, and where they may go. As a sort of plainclothes citizen, would I be surprised to find out, would any of us be surprised to find out under circumstances like this just how much you can find out about people? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's a lot. Uh, once you, once the, you go full throttle with the full force of the U.S. government in a massive global intelligence collection operation, very few people have any appreciation of how much data that involves.